Hola amigos! Welcome to this new Unreal tutorial where we are going to learn about the jump float algorithm. This is a very interesting method to generate Voronoi diagrams and distance fields and has a lot of different uses like generate outlines, very creative effects or even drive Niagara systems. So without further ado, let's get started. The jump float algorithm, or JFA for short, is, as the name implies, a floating algorithm. This means that it expands and distributes a value across the entire texture space, like the float field tool in Photoshop or how a real float disperses material. In our case, the value is going to be the distance to the closest pixel from a set. For example, if we had a discrete set of, set of pixels, something like this, we can use this information to generate a Voronoi diagram like this one. In this other example, instead of a few scattered points, let's take all the pixels from this silhouette here. If we run the algorithm on this set and store the UV coordinates of the closest point on this mask, we'll get something like this. And without the mask, you can still get a vague idea of the original shape but it's harder to see. Another use of JFA, since it gives us the location of the nearest pixel from the set, is to generate distance fields from masks, like it is happening here. And if we can generate a science distance field and we can measure the distance to the closest point in this mask, we can also use this information to generate outlines like the ones in this image here. This one which comes from a phenomenal blog post on the subject by Ben Golus, link on the description, reveals the main advantage of using this method. If you have ever tried to get a very thick outlines effect, you probably have found that it's either too expensive or requires making custom meshes that never end up looking right. Well, here's a graph that from the same blog post that shows a comparison between different shader-based methods. As you can see, JFA only loses against a 1 pixel radius brute force, but the time stays practically constant throughout the curve even with a 50 pixel radius outline. And now that we can understand what the algorithm can do, let's see how it works. Technically this is not part of the algorithm, but for our method, the first thing that we're going to do is to initialize our texture. So, let's say that we want to apply the JFA to this mask here. In this first step, we're going to generate a texture where all the black areas will have a value of minus 1 and on the mask's pixels, their UV coordinates. So, if this is our texture coordinate space, with 0 to 1 on both X and Y axis, at the end of this pass, we'll have something like this with a value of minus 1 everywhere except on the areas covered by the mask, where we're going to store the UV position. Once we have initialized our mask, we'll run the actual JFA on it. And to make the explanation simpler, let's switch to an 8x8 texture. Here we have two pixels. This one at coordinates x3 and y equal 4, we're counting from 0, and this one at 4, 4. I gave them different colors to make it easier to see, but remember, these values represent the coordinates that we store in the init pass. So, what the algorithm says is, for each pixel, go on every cardinal direction, some distance, and check the values stored on those pixels. Next, take all the valid values, in our case that will be all those that are not equal to minus 1, and keep the one that is the closest to the position of the original pixel that we are running the algorithm on. Let's see it in practice. The first step will be run with a jump distance of half of the texture size. So if our texture is 8 pixels long, let's do a jump of 4 pixels. So if we take a start from here at 0, 0, there's nothing, there's minus 1 in this direction, 1, 2, 3, 4, there's also minus 1 in this direction, and in these ones we get out of the texture. But on the diagonal, 
one, two, three, four. We're sampling a four, four, uh, or a blue pixel. Now, from those values, the only one valid is the blue one. And so blue is the closest value to zero, zero. So let's put, uh, let's make it in a different layer so we can reduce the opacity of this one. There we go. So we have a blue pixel here. Now, if we keep moving pixel by pixel, this one doesn't reach anything. Same here, but here we are reaching this pixel and that's the only one that we are getting to. We keep moving. Here we have a blue pixel and here we'll sample this one. One, two, three, four. Yes, that one. Now, these three lines will be empty on this first pass, but on this next line, on this first pixel, one, two, three, four, we get a blue value. And on the last pixel, one, two, three, four, we get a pink value. And that's it. The rest of the texture in this first pass will be empty. Now we'll store that in our render target and apply this again but this time with a jump distance of half of the previous jump. So if our previous jump was at four pixels distance, this one will be at two. And I'm going to spare you the pixel by pixel rundown of the algorithm, but at the end of this second step, we'll get something like this. And now this looks like a very regular pattern because we, also, we only had two pixels to begin with, but also doesn't look very promising. And this, all this part should be pink if it's the closest to the pink pixel. But let's see what happens when we run this, the algorithm again, this time with half of the previous distance, which is one pixel. So starting here, we are sampling this one, this one, this one, and then pixels that are outside of the texture. So for the first time, now we have two values to choose. We can choose a blue, uh, a blue pixel, but we also sample this pink pixel. Now, the closest value to zero, zero is pink because, well, pink, the original pink, which is this pixel, is closest to this position than this one. This is slightly farther away, like one pixel away or a bit less, right? So we need to change the value store here to pink. And if we keep running the algorithm over the same, over the rest of the texture, at the end of this step, we'll get something that looks like the desired result. And now let's go back to Unreal and make it happen. Here's our basic setup for today. I've already created a new blueprint called JFA Updater. It's still empty and inherits from the default pawn. And that's so it can be easily said to be auto-possessed by player zero and control when we press play on the editor. And in the next tutorial, we will see how to use this as a post-process pass using a second render target. But today, I thought that it would be simpler to use static textures. So I have two of those, this little nine cat and this ring, and both of these textures have alpha channels. Okay, let me close everything here, and now we can get it started. Let's begin with our texture initialize pass. We're going to do that with a new material that then we'll apply to a render target. So let's create a new material, call this one JFA init. Now, we just need the emissive color, so on the material parameters we can change the shading model to unlit, and also search for negative. We need to output values that are less than zero, so let's check the box for allow negative emissive color. Now we can bring one of our textures, let's do the ring. And let's see, sometimes we want to output minus one, minus one, so let's do a vector two, constant two vector, and set it to minus one, minus one. And the rest of the times, we want to output the texture coordinate. And we can switch between both using a linear interpolate or lerp 
so connect this one to the input A and the texture coordinates to the input B. Now, in theory, we could just connect the alpha of the texture to the alpha of the layer. And let's output that on the emissive. And now we have it. We have our mask and inside the mask we can see the UV coordinates. However, let's zoom in and see what we're looking at here. So we have this red line and that's because of how sampling and MIP mapping works. And I won't go into the details, but that's going to cause problems in the future. Because if we are using these coordinates as to measure the distance between these points and others, well, this would be like a 0, 1 coordinate, and that's not correct. This point is here, around, I don't know, 0 0.7 through 0 0.3 or something like that, right? So we need to fix that. And there is a couple nodes that we could use for that. We could do it with a step node or a custom node, but let's do an if. So if our alpha is greater than zero, we'll output a one. And if our alpha on the texture is equal or less than zero, let's output a zero. And now let's replace this alpha input on the lerp. And now we have a perfectly crisp mask. However, it's also revealing that the alpha on this texture wasn't very well done because we have a few spikes here and there. Now we can increase this threshold a little bit and instead of zero, we can compare against maybe 0 0.03 or four. Yeah, three is not bad. And now we have a crisp texture. Great, now we can apply and save and go to our blueprint to start making changes there. Before doing that, let's create a render target for our material. So texture render target, call this one RT JFA. And probably we want to increase the resolution, maybe match the texture 1024 by 1024. And we can change the target format. This is an optional step, but to a float 32 to have a bit more precision on our numbers. And I didn't mention before, and some of you might already thought about it, but our init pass is going to use only the red and green channels, which leaves us with the blue and alpha channels to store other useful information for our effects. Like, for example, a noise or a sea of different seeds or offsets, or even something like the stencil value if we are using this as a post process effect. And let's ignore all this for now and now save and go to our blueprint. I've already went ahead and created a couple of keyboard events just for debugging purposes. So let's create a new function and we can call this one init RT. Let's put this one on I don't know, X. In future videos, we'll parameterize all this, but for now let's do the quick and dirty way. So on this function, first we're going to clear our render target. And let's just drag and drop the one that we created. Perfect. Next, we're going to begin draw canvas to render target. And let's bring the same render target. Now we can drag from the canvas and look for draw material. Now the material that we want to draw on this render target is the our JFA init material. And also copy the size to the screen size on the draw material node. Now we can draw from the context and look for end and select end draw canvas to render target. So we are starting the paint process, then we are painting our material, and then we are ending the paint process. Let's compile and save, and save this works. So I'm going to open the our render target here on the side, and if I press play and hit X, 
now we have our mask. Great. So this works. Now let's create our JFA pass. Much like we did with our init pass, this is going to be a material that then we apply to our render target. So let's create a new material, call this one maybe JFA pass. Now we need to change the same material parameters as earlier, so shading model to unlit and also allow negative emissive color. Otherwise, when we sample the other texture, even if it has negative values, those will be automatically clamped when it gets to this material. So now we can bring our texture. And actually, let's do a texture object parameter so we can change by a dynamic render target later on. Call this one maybe RT. And just for this example, let's give it the default value our render target. Great. Now we are going to need also our texture coordinate and a scalar parameter that we can call maybe step. Give it a 0.5 default. Now let's create a new custom node. We can co maybe call this one JFA and we'll need a few inputs, three of them. The first one is going to be our UV coordinates. The second one, a texture to sample. And the third one, our step size. So let's connect all of those. And let me write the custom node in a different warpad and I'll come right back. And here's the code. As you can see, it is not too complicated, but let's go line by line to see what everything does. First, we're creating and initializing two variables, best distance and best UVs, one set to a really high number and one to minus one minus one. Next, these two nested for loops will allow us to check all the pixels around the center one, including that one. First, we are defining an offset UVs by adding the current UVs to this vector2 defined by these variables, multiplied by the step size. Next, we are sampling that texture at those offset UV coordinates and storing the red and green channels, or XY, in this float2 called temp value. Next, we are getting the distance between the value that we sample and the current position of the pixel, without the offsets. And if the temporary value that we sampled is greater than zero, so is not minus one, minus one, and if the distance that we calculate is less than the best distance that we have saved so far, which starts at really high number, then store the current distance as the best one, and store the current value as the best UV. And when we're done with those for loops, then return a float for composed by the UV coordinates and then on the blue and alpha channels return zero. And now we can copy this and go back to Unreal to paste it in our custom node. Let's paste our code and connect this to the emissive color, and it seems to be working. We have copies of our mask at 0.5 distance, which is half of the texture size. And if we reduce this, the circles get closer and closer. Yeah, 0.03, they get really close. But you might have noticed that we have some noise going on and some kind of more air noise going on here. And if we zoom in, we see that the edges are back to having some error. And that's again because of how MIP mapping and sampling works. So our texture is perfectly crisp. But here we're passing a texture coordinate, just yes, unmodified, 
which means that sometimes in practice it's like having our texture coordinate point to half of a pixel. Or, and we need these positions to be centered, otherwise we'll get errors when we calculate the distance to the position stored on the mask. Now that has an easy solution, which is use point sample UVs. There's a function that does that in Unreal called point sample UVs, and we can connect the texture coordinate here as the first input, and for the second one, we're going to need the texture size. So we can drag from the texture and search for property, and we have this texture property node. Now, by default, it's giving us the texture size. We could also get the texture size if we wanted, but not in this case. And let's connect this here and replace our UVs on our custom node with these point sample UVs. And now the noise is gone. Perfect. Now we just need to apply this pass iteratively on the same render target a number of times. And we'll do that in our blueprint next. Since we want to change the material parameters on every iteration of the loop, we will need to create a dynamic material instance of that. So on the begin play, search for dynamic material and create ma dynamic material instance. Now the parent asset is gonna, to, gonna be our JFA pass material. And then we can promote the return value to a variable and give this a proper name, maybe uh, dynamic material instance JFA pass. Cool. Now we need to make a new function. We can call this JFA pass update. And let's call this on the set key event. Okay, so we know that we need to run this pass a certain number of times. So we can start with a for loop. Oop. For loop. And set the first index to 1. And the last index is going to be the number of iterations. So let's think about it for a moment because we can pre-calculate this number. We know that we just need to cover half of the texture size. And we also know that on every iteration, we are dividing the previous distance by 2 until we get to the smallest possible distance. So if we knew the texture size, so let's create a new float parameter or variable and call this texture size. And get a reference to that and divide it by 2. Oh, there we go. Now we don't know that we know that 2 to the power of the number of iterations is going to be equal to half of the texture size. So we can solve that equation with a logarithm. So the logarithm on base 2 of half of the texture distance is going to be our maximum number of iterations. Great. Next, inside the loop body, the first thing that we need to do is grab a reference to our dynamic material so we can set the new step size. So set a scalar parameter value. Parameter name is step. And let's calculate also this number. So it's going to be 2 to the power of the index first, so this is going to be 2, then 4, 8, 16, and so on. So we just now need to divide 1 by that number. So 1 divided by 2 is 0 0.5, then 0 0.25, and so on. Perfect. Now we need to do the same thing that we did on our init RT function, which was the begin draw canvas, draw material, and end draw canvas combo. 
So we can just copy these nodes from here, paste them, and reconnect our first node here. Now, don't forget to update the render material to use the dynamic material that we created earlier. And that should be it. Now, you might have seen other tutorials on the jump floating algorithm that mention that you need to do this using two render targets using a ping pong technique to bounce the one that you draw on on every iteration because you cannot write and read from the same render target at the same time. And while that's technically true, by using this begin draw canvas and end draw canvas, you can think of it as reserving the preserving the render target in some state until we finish drawing, which allows us to circumvent that limitation. So let's compile and save and see if everything is working. Let's create some geometry to display a render target. So maybe a plane. Rotate this 90 degrees and then maybe scale it five times. Now here's a little trick. If we drag a texture from the content browser, let's drag our render target. It will also create a material with the same name or underscore mat at the end, which will be composed by our texture sample output in the alpha as opacity mask and the RGB as base color. So we're not using the alpha. So let's change this to unlit and output that as emissive. Hit apply and save, and now we can see if it's working. So, first we update our initialization mask, and then there we have it. The jump float algorithm is giving us the distance to the closest pixel or the position, the UV coordinates of the closest pixel in the original mask. So, we can still see. Parts of it, we can see that it's a circle and the spikes pointing inwards are what's creating these shapes. And that's pretty cool. Let's see what else we can do with this. Here's a small showcase highlighting a few of the uses of the jump float algorithm. So let me update it. And first we have the basic one that we just made. And here we're using it to calculate a distance field. So let's open that one. In that one, it's just as simple as sampling our texture, masking the red and green components, and then finding the distance between that point and the texture coordinates. And that gives us values 0 to 1 based on the distance to the closest pixel. Right. But as you can see, here we have a weird artifact. And that's the same problem as always. In this case, you can imagine it as this point. Half of the pixel is closest to that one and half of the pixel is closest to that one. So when we accumulate the results, it gets us zero. And that's why we get this black kind of half pixel curve. Now, if we move to the next material, here is fixed and it works at any distance and we get a perfect result all the time. Now let's see that one. Let's see this. On that one, you might be already used to this solution. We are doing the point sample UVs both to sample the texture but also to calculate the distance. And to make sure that this doesn't break uh, when the camera moves at certain angles or too far away from the object, we are also setting the MIP level of this texture sample to zero. So we always sample the texture pixels at the maximum detail. Now, after doing these changes, our effect doesn't break at any distance. Cool. Now, the next one, we're using this same distance to calculate uh, an outline. And it can be as thick as, I don't know, the entire texture size if we want. 
with no additional cost. And on that one, there's a couple other ways to do it, but we're just taking the fixed distance from the previous material and using an if. We are comparing it with an outline size and if the distance is less than this value, we are outputting a color. And if it's bigger than that value, we are outputting zero. So we can change this parameter and make outlines of any size. And we can also change the color here. And finally, we have this beautiful rainbow effect inspired by a shader toy example of the jump float algorithm. So let's open this one up. Here we're taking the distance, again the fixed distance using the point sample UVs, and then doing a bunch of math based on the current time. Oh, I won't go into the details of this, so feel free to pause the video here and copy this formula. I'm using the distance twice, first in this subtraction here at the beginning, and next on this absolute value for the smooth step. Finally, the output goes straight up into the emissive. And there we have a few uses of this technique. In the next video, we'll see a few more, including post-process effects. But that's gonna be it for this tutorial. I hope you guys had a good time. If you did, please consider giving a like and subscribing to see more content like this. See you next time!